So the, the Māori health providers, they did progress into, after a period of time, having nurses, um, and then some of them managed to get GPs, and they kind of grew from there. And we'll talk a bit about some of those in a little while. Um, and there were some disability providers. But by and large, when they first started the Māori health provider organisations, which was in the early 90s, they tended to be things like smoking cessation programmes or community programmes for people that were drinking and things like that. And so a small number of them in 92, and then in, in 1993, something happened that was a little bit funny. Um, the government decided it was going to introduce new legislation, basically to try to um, get the general practices, which were private at that stage, um, into new contracts. They didn't want to um, carry on the current funding mechanism that they had in 95, uh, 93. Rather. They wanted to actually have... Um, doctors bill them in a different way and also sign particular contracts for payment with them. Now the doctors rebelled like anything on earth, um, the GPs didn't want to do this, um, but what the, the government had done is they'd hired a whole lot of accountants and lawyers to set these these new sort of things up and when the doctors and lawyers and their, sorry, the lawyers and accountants in their nice little building who knew nothing about health whatsoever. They'd been given their instructions. They opened the doors on day one ready to sign and stamp off the little contracts and give them back to all of the GPs. The only people standing at the door were a whole lot of Māori going, oh, we'd like to have a Māori health provider, please, and here's our documentation. And of course, they didn't know any different, so they went, oh, yeah, stamp and gave them back. And so the poor old Minister of Health was going, oh, how's everything going? Oh, yes, we've got a lot of people turned up and we've signed a lot of people up, so it's going very well. Um, and so, not on purpose, um, on purpose by Māori, but certainly not on purpose by the government. And I, I don't think the government meant to exclude them, but I don't think Māori had, I, I don't think the government had any idea how many Māori would turn up wanting to have a Māori health provider organisation and would fulfil the right criteria, because they didn't have to have GPs. They could be a primary care provider with nurses. So that's what quite a few of them did. Um, and so by the time they turned around, the Act came in in 1993, and by 1995 there were 160 Māori health providers. And so and that just was like, oh my goodness. And so they had to then give them some funding and let them do a few things and let them get set up and all of the rest of it. We had another legislative change in 1997. They might have grown slightly wiser by then. And so... The numbers that you see of the plus 25 in 1997 um, um, also take into account that some of those uh, Māori provider organisations from the mid-90s did not actually last uh, through to 97. So they arrived in 93, some of them didn't last till 97, and there were some other new ones. So there was a little bit of change. Um, and then, obviously, in 2003, we had another new act, so a few more got added. Um, and by 2017, we have apparently uh, got um, 280 now. So, I mean, that's a quite interesting, as you can see, um, between 95 and 2017. That's, a, as I hope it's a net growth of 47, but if I've got that maths completely wrong, I'm sure you'll forgive me. Because one of the things I cannot do at the moment are numbers. Right, so the majority of the contracts are for ta services targeted towards Māori, Pacifica and Haini communities. However, you've got some differences in the way some of the Māori provider organisations work. So if you've got my mother sitting there, um, she's got this Māori health provider organisation, and as far as she's concerned, a patient's a patient. Whoever comes in the door, the GPs and the nurses and the social workers and the physios and the dentists and the gynaecologists and the obstetricians and the paediatricians, whoever they are, they treat the patients coming through the door because a patient's a patient. And mum's perspective is... I'm on my tribal lands, we've got a Māori health provider, I'm responsible for anybody that walks through that door that is a patient. I don't care where they're from or what their need is, they are a priority. Then you go to my father, same tribe, um, and he is he was running a Māori health provider up in the country. So uh, that's a rural health provider and they have mobile nurses, Māori nurses um, who were mobile, they would go out and visit the patients in the small village fishing villages and communities and stuff like that. 
which when they first started were off the grid. So they used to have to drive in a four wheel drive with a little radio telephone and all the rest of it, all quite exciting. Um, and so, um, and he, you know, you talk to him back then about what he considered a Maori health provider to be. He was like, oh no, it's for our tribe only, by us, for us, by Māori, for Māori only. Um, and so that caused a lot of tension because, of course, under the Human Rights Act, which came in, and I should know, came in in 1993, I think. So the Human Rights Act, I think, came in in 1993. The government got a pass to not actually have to apply it until um, 2003. And so under that, the government was actually giving out contracts to these Māori health providers saying, you may only see Māori patients. And so um, for some Māori health providers, they were very happy about that. For other Māori health providers, they weren't happy, like my mother, they weren't happy about that because what would happen is they'd have a contract but they could only tick that they had seen a patient if the patient was a Māori and they'd only get the money for that person and not for the other 20 patients they'd seen that hour that were non Māori or that day or whatever. So um, I, for some reason, ended up in a job at the Human Rights Commission and Race Relations Office and um, was, was helping out. Um, with administrative type stuff there um, back in the mid 90s and um, the whole question of um, Māori health contracts forcing Māori health providers to only be allowed to get funding for Māori patients kind of got resolved. I'm not sure how that happened. So that was good. But, you know, th this is the thing. Is that when you're doing anything to do with Indigenous health, um, there are all these barriers that get put in your play put in, in front of people trying to do good work and stuff, and you have to kind of figure out how to get around them, which in my case meant getting a job at the Human Rights Commission so we could, you know, um, get the conversation started. So, and make sure that we were kind of right legally. So th that's kind of um, some of the interesting stuff about how policy works and Māori are really happy with how it worked, they're really happy with the Māori health provider organisations and stuff like that. What they're not happy about is that, um, and I'll give you an example, you, you remember I was telling you about that, um, the, um, the farm um, where we, we had the chickens and stuff like that next, next door and um, we had the young Māori men come and stay that, um, who were in trouble with the law um, for alcohol and drugs and um, and, and but they also had mental health issues, uh, uh, diagnosis, mental health diagnosis. And um, so the, I was asked to come to a meeting and the, um, just to supervise, if you like, a meeting that was happening, the government was coming to close them down. And so they'd sent people up from government to close it down because they said they couldn't deliver the services properly. And so the government workers arrived, I think there were three or four of them or something, I can't remember now, I think it was maybe three or four, and they arrived and um, I, I welcomed them and said, oh, you know, come inside, and I walked inside and I'm like, oh, this is interesting, so I just sort of introduced everybody and I stepped back and so they sat around the table with, um, you know, with these nicely dressed people with all of the information and the contracts and the details and um, explaining what had happened with this particular contract requirement, etc., and around the walls, leaning against the walls in jeans and t-shirts and, you know, just, just looking pretty relaxed, were all these people sort of leaning against the walls, kind of watching what was going on and listening. Anyway, um, at the end of it, these people were really impressed with what was actually happening. And uh, what the um, people at the table said to them is, we've got evidence here that there is a non-Maori provider doing exactly the same work as us in the next sub suburb over, but they get three times the amount of money that we get. How come they get three times as more and, uh, as us? Because, look, here's ours and here's theirs. That's just not fair. Why, why have you done that? Why are you giving them more than us? And, and they've got their contract for five years and our contract is only for one year and you, you keep rolling it over. Why is that? And so... Um, you know, they, they, these people felt quite aggrieved on, but you know, the government workers felt quite aggrieved and they, they walked out and they're all positive and they're, you know, all excited to get back to Wellington and go, this place is great, no, we have to keep funding them. And I said to them, oh, just before you go, do you mind if I mention something? I said, um, you know the people you were talking to at the table? Yeah, they weren't the staff, that was the patients. I said, I don't know why, but those were the patients and the people standing around the walls were actually the staff. And I said patients to them because they were all doctors. Um, well, half of them were doctors, where I would normally have said clients, of course. And so it was, um, they burst, two of them burst into tears. They were just so distressed. And I was like, 
And they said, how could this happen? And I said, well, it's the government. You guys are always doing it to us, you know. It's just a really good example. Please watch out for it in the future with others. So, you know, these are, that, that particular situation occurred, I think, off the top of my head, maybe 1999-2000. So, you know, there's this constant challenge to try to get things Māori um, functioning, succeeding, um, and then to defend it to survive.